You know by now that we're all about the journey. June's journey, that is. Like, I feel this game was made for us specifically. It's the closest I've come to feeling like I've been dropped in the middle of a mystery novel set in the 1920s. That's because you get to play as June, a globe-trotting flapper slash amateur sleuth who lives to solve mysteries. You get to visit all sorts of fascinating places, from Paris to Cuba. You beat levels by identifying hidden objects in the scene. And we found that the more we play, the sharper our observational skills become. The game is delightful and a wonderful way to relax. I'll often pull my phone out and play it when I've got a free moment, like I'm on hold with an archive or I'm waiting for a courthouse to open up in the morning. I'm currently on Chapter 16, meaning I'm searching for the son of June's housekeeper, who's on the run from New Orleans gamblers and the police. It's a wild time. We know our audience is filled with folks who love a good mystery. Now is your chance to try your hand at being a sleuth yourself. Discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Content warning. This episode discusses the murder of two children. It seems everyone in the online community that follows the Delphi murders is talking about the documents that were recently released in the Richard Allen case. Those filings, of course, were released in response to a motion we filed with the assistance of attorney Shay Hughes. You can find Shay on Instagram under the name The Hoosier Public Defender. He offers terrific legal analysis there, and we highly recommend you give him a follow. Since Shay was one of the people responsible for this release, we wanted to hear his opinions about what was made public, what it means, and what we can expect next. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. We first connected while looking into the Burger Chef murders, an Indiana cold case. Together, we built a spreadsheet documenting hundreds of cases of restaurant-related homicides. That original spreadsheet gave way to our podcast, The Murder Sheet. Now we maintain that same research-centric, investigative approach as we look into all sorts of homicides, including unsolved cases, historical crimes, and, of course, restaurant murders. We don't just chat about the headlines. Our podcast is a platform for our journalism. The Murder Sheet focuses on investigative reporting, thoughtful analysis, thorough research, and in-depth interviews. We're the Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders, a talk with the Hoosier Public Defender about the Delphi documents. We just wanted to start off the interview by just thanking you profusely for the, the you know, filing and, and everything seemed to work out so well on that front. So we just wanted to say again, thank you, Shay. <laughs> yeah, no problem. It, it really worked out well for us. So we do appreciate your help. Let's start by talking about those documents. Did anything in particular jump out to you from those documents? Um, I would say the... Well, I, I obviously, there was the, the, the disclosure about Richard Allen uh, allegedly making some incriminating phone calls to his wife. But other than that, I would say the search warrant was something that stood out to me. What about the search warrant stood out to you? I think there's an argument to be made about some of the items uh, that were ultimately seized pursuant to the search warrant being suppressed. Um, you know, I don't know whether or not the court will... Uh, you know, making reasonable inference uh, about some of the items that were seized. But I think they have a a decent argument to suppress um, some of the items, including 
a handgun, the 40 caliber ammunition that was recovered. Um, you know, the general statement about clothing, cell phones or electronic devices that were seized. In your view, is that a possible slam dunk suppression hearing for the defense or would it be up in the air, but they have an opportunity there? I, I still think it's going to be pretty difficult. I mean, search warrants are presumed valid. And, you know, even if you could show that there's some type of defectiveness, um, you know, then you need to ultimately show why good faith exception doesn't apply. And, you know, that's pretty difficult for defense. But over and all, I, I think there's a decent argument to be made. Absolutely. And and just for our listeners who might not be as familiar with, you know, how that works or what makes a search warrant valid versus elements of it maybe invalid, um, I'm curious, what would be the thinking, just that the initial warrant was too vague? Yeah, I think they, you know, when I read through it, um, essentially there was some loose ends that just weren't tied. I mean, you know, there's mention about a handgun, um, seizing a handgun, but there's no real reference into how, what role that would have played in into the allegations. Um, you know, I may, I guess you can, you know, for instance, make an inference about the unspent round being located nearby. But, you know, in, in reply to something like that, I would say, well, there's no reference about it appearing that it looked like it was ejected, for instance. Um, you know, there's a lot towards the end of the search warrant about electronic devices and cell phones generally being used in such crimes. Uh, but that all comes from the officer. It wasn't like, you know, Richard Allen had in his statement, uh, you know, made reference about a cell phone. Um, so, you know, I think there are some arguments to be made. Absolutely. And and one thing we noticed about the search warrant, or rather I should say one of our eagle-eyed listeners noticed and flagged with us, um, was some elements of the timing that I think have some people a bit, you know, wondering about that. Kevin, would you explain it? Because I feel like I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> well, basically, in one of the documents, Prosecutor McClellan indicates that the search took place roughly like from 5 o'clock to 7 p.m. And then when you look at the actual search warrant, it appears that it was signed by Judge Diener. Uh, sometime just after 6.30. And so uh, the question our listener had is, how can a search begin around 5 o'clock if the actual paperwork isn't officially signed until an hour and a half later? Yeah, I'm not really sure about what transpired there. I mean, I saw that too, but, uh, you know, I just don't know. Hypothetically, is it possible to um, for law enforcement to get some sort of verbal permission from a judge or verbal kind of go ahead and then get the paperwork done later? Or is that something that's not allowed? Um, I mean, you can have uh, telephonic um, search warrants. You can have, you know, by email, um, you know, swearing off on everything. I mean, that, that definitely could happen. Um, I would hope something like that would ultimately be memorialized somewhere if that's the case. You know, this could have been something as simple as, you know, failing to actually put the, the time, I, I don't know, or, or failing to sign it. Um, I simply don't know. Do you think there's anything in the documents that the press missed as far as being relevant or important? Um, I don't think there's too much that the press missed out on. You, you know, the big thing that I... I guess had an issue with is why these documents were made confidential to begin with, you know, because it seemed to start on April 5th when defense filed their emergency motion to modify safekeeping order. And I believe initially that was public for a brief time and then it was confident confidentially kept. Um, it was no longer publicly accessible and I thought that was kind of odd because there was no notice of exclusion form accompanied with that motion. And then come to find out, many of the requests seemed to cite to um, access to court records rule six, which I think is problematic because there are some procedural hurdles related to that rule that clearly were not done to keep those records confidential. Um, you know, there's some reference to the gag order, but, you know, the gag order covered extrajudicial statements, so out-of-court statements. That doesn't pertain to 
court filings. Um, so, you know, I think that's really the only thing. I think there probably should be more scrutiny on why was this done to begin with. Yeah, I know we've gotten some kind of like vibes behind the scene that maybe there was some confusion amongst maybe people who were like working in the courthouse, the clerks, um, around what the gag order entailed and maybe an overabundance of some caution here. Um, sure. But it's like you would think they would know. But at the same time, I, I can understand it's a high profile case. I, I, I just think it was interesting because we were basically told, you know, people can complain about this behind the scenes as much as they want, but nothing's going to happen unless somebody files in and, you know, brings it to the attention of the judge, essentially. So it was kind of like definitely a situation where I think everyone realized something was very weird and off, but it just kind of was left kind of to go in that route for a while. Agreed. And then I want to ask a very basic question that uh, I think has caused some confusion among some quarters, which is basically, can you explain what the difference is between like court filings, such as we're, what were unsealed in this case versus discovery materials that would be turned over to the defense. Yeah. So court filings obviously would be, I mean, what you file with the court itself, you know, there it's docketed, it's there. And then discovery would be essentially any evidence that, you know, you intend on either directly or indirectly, um, you know, plan on admitting or presenting during trial. And that necessarily, you know, doesn't always get filed. I mean, there are circumstances where those two things overlap. Um, but um, much of the discovery, you, you just don't file with a court filing. And then on top of it, you know, it could be confidential for a number of reasons. One thing that we've tried to convey to our listeners and hopefully have made clear, um, but I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on this. Uh, just kind of branching out on that discovery versus court filings discussion is that, you know, we shouldn't look to court filings to explain everything we want to know about this case. Um, A lot of people have asked, well, are these court filings going to include reference to other suspects who've come up in the past or, you know, different um, mysteries of the case that remain unclear? And I think, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, but I think we've been trying to say that like, that could potentially come up in trial either from the prosecution or the defense's strategy. Um, But most likely the court filings are just going to pertain to whatever motions the defense and the prosecution are going to be making. And there's not going to, the purpose is the functionality of that, not revealing everything that we need to know about what happened to these girls. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you're, you're only going to address issues that, I guess, pertain to the case. You, you necessarily wouldn't, how do I say it, um, present your case, you know, through, uh, you know, the procedure or through the docket. You know, that, that just generally doesn't happen. You, you may have some sense of where things are going by filings here and there, but you're not going to see everything. Absolutely. Well said. Um, and in terms of, you know, the discovery, my understanding and, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, as you mentioned, there might be some instances where there is overlap, but generally we'd only be seeing potentially a portion of that at trial, essentially. Yeah. I mean, there's a, you receive a lot more than, than is ultimately presented and and submitted into evidence that. Yes. I want to uh, go back. We kind of started by talking a little bit about suppression issues. Mm-hmm. And we uh, our understanding is that the defense has raised some Franks versus uh, Delaware issues. Can you tell us a little bit about what a Franks issue is and what a Franks hearing is and what that means? Yes. So essentially what it means is that there was some type of false statement made within the affidavit and you'd have to make a preliminary showing of what the statement is that you claim to be false and why it is false. Um, and that wasn't provided within the motion. And if I 
correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you were there um, for the hearing. I think at that time it got raised and then they needed proper notice to be issued. Um, so defense needs to make a preliminary, essentially they need to make a preliminary showing that there's a false statement and why it is false. They need to provide that within, you know, their motion to suppress. Um, where it comes from, Frank's is, is just referencing a Supreme Court case that provides kind of the procedure in addressing such a matter. And and with a Frank's motion, I mean, are those common to be used in, in these kind of criminal cases? No, not really. Um, I'm trying to think of a time that I've addressed that. Um, you know, I, I th- I've only had really one case, and I wouldn't necessarily say it was false information. I think there was... Uh, uh, recklessly supplied or, or, you know, highly omitted information that would have diminished probable cause. Um, So it doesn't come up often. We've talked a lot about how great HelloFresh is when it comes to meals. They really want you to have it all, free time and delicious food. That's why they take care of all the meal planning and even ship the ingredients right to your door so you've got everything you need to make a wonderful meal for yourself and your family. But let's chat a moment about a side of HelloFresh we didn't know about ourselves until very recently. I'll be honest. I don't just eat at meal times. During the day or when I'm relaxing in the evening, I like to munch on snacks or sides. And I assumed that was something HelloFresh could not help me with. So I would still have to trudge out to the grocery store and stand in line to get those sorts of treats. But I was wrong. Let me tell you about HelloFresh Market. It lets you shop online and take your pick from a curated selection of over 100 items, including all sorts of tasty treats and desserts. And it will all be added to your weekly HelloFresh delivery. It's the best of meal kits and online grocery shopping combined in one weekly box. This is another great reason to try out HelloFresh. And remember, Murder Sheet listeners get a special discount. Go to HelloFresh.com slash msheet50. And use code MSHEET50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash MSHEET50 and use code MSHEET50 for 50% off plus free shipping. Try out America's number one meal kit today. We are so delighted to work with our sponsor, Brilliant Earth. This is a company that offers some of the most brilliant and romantic engagement rings and wedding bands out there, all the while ensuring a commitment to ethical sourcing and sustainability. If you're looking to get married or to become engaged, or even if you're just searching for a special piece of fine jewelry, you have to check out their website. They make browsing so easy. They even let you design your own perfect engagement ring, or you can shop by style I love the delicate willow rings, along with the three stone Nadia rings and the classic freesia rings. It's so hard to choose. And you don't have to worry about the ethical implications of your purchase. Your special gift, your engagement ring, your wedding band should never be tarnished by the idea that the gems or materials came from an abusive system. See, Brilliant Earth has a commitment to beyond conflict-free diamonds. That means one thing. They only accept diamonds from mining operations and countries that strictly follow international labor, trade, and environmental standards. Fewer than 1% of other diamond suppliers meet Brilliant Earth standards. You can feel good about your purchase, knowing that you're supporting a brand that actually cares about its ethical impact and is committed to fostering better standards in the jewelry business. Check out all of their beautiful pieces at BrilliantEarth.com. That's BrilliantEarth.com. And, and for our listeners who might not be as familiar with law enforcement or criminal law, um, what would be like the difference hypothetically between, you know, a detective not including a detail that they would consider irrelevant or something versus like an omission that would warrant a Frank's motion, something like that? Well, what I can say is this, is many jurisdictions, I guess practically how affidavits are addressed, many jurisdictions have a prosecutor on call 24-7. 
um, to review and assist in drafting search warrants and then ultimately applying for one. In other words, presenting it to a judge to review who ultimately decides whether or not the search warrant should be issued. Generally, you see issues come up with omissions when they're they're just not mentioning some some of the, I guess, bad facts, um, things that would diminish probable cause. Often you see this in, in kind of drug dealing investigations where there's some type of issue with the confidential informant. You know, and they mention the, the informant, they mention the presence of an informant and what information they've provided, but they haven't provided, I guess, credibility issues surrounding the confidential informant. So off the top of my head, you know, hey, look, previously this informant's provided information, provided false information in the past, or, you know, there are times where we couldn't corroborate what the informant was saying or, um, you know, things of that nature would be an example um, I just, I have no idea what it could be in reference to this instance. I, I just simply don't know. Um, my big issue with the search warrant is I think there are some loose ends. I just, there's no mention of how a handgun was tied to this crime. I think you just have to reasonably infer with with the uh, unspent round. I mean, there's a general reference to clothing. I think that is not particular. It is overly broad. Um, you know, when they, when they reference the color of clothing, I think that's fine. There's no problem with that. Um, but then mentioning, you know, electronic cell phones, again, you know, there, there wasn't anything factually for why they believed or any facts presented other than the officer's opinion for why that need to be seized. So I think there's an issue there as well. But as you say, it's very rare for a search warrant to be successfully challenged and thrown out. It is. There's only a handful of cases out there in Indiana, um, you know, where a search warrant is deemed invalid. And a lot of them are, I would say, are controlled substances and or, you know, dealing cases. To talk about Franks again for a moment, basically it it, uh, appears as if when you have a Franks hearing, you're essentially accusing law enforcement of either lying or admitting something crucial. Is that a risky strategy? Uh, I don't think it's risky. I mean, if, if, um, you know, if you have a good faith basis to uh, believe that, you know, there's been false or recklessly omitted information that I think that's that's fine. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't consider it a, a risk, no. Um, one other thing that we've been sort of noticing that came out of these documents is this inmate, Robert Bastone, sort of providing um, the defense with some claims about prison conditions and what Richard Allen is going through in Westville. And we're just curious... Um, What do you make of that? Is that common to see that in some sort of, you know, due process issue? I cannot, you know, there are a number of times where clients themselves file letters. I mean, I think I experience that daily. Um, But another inmate filing a letter on behalf of somebody else, that generally doesn't happen. You know, in some respects, I mean, some courts kind of treat it, I will say this, some courts may treat it as just not a proper filing. They won't docket it, and they'll just send it to the parties to address it if they feel it's necessary. Um, but you generally don't see that. Right. I, I My personal opinion with Best Joan is that he has pretty severe credibility issues himself, so I was surprised to see that come up in this way um, when, when, to me, it feels like um, the defense's claims about Westville seem reasonable from the sense that it's very unusual for there to be a pretrial detainee in the first place. So it sort of seemed odd to include this w- other Westville inmate when I felt like they made the points pretty well themselves. But yeah. Yeah. It, and I'm guessing, you know, that inmate did it on his own volition for whatever reason. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And and then this is just maybe um, a, a personal opinion I guess, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are. 
it it seems like so far from the defense side, there's been a lot of energy expended upon the due process issue, him being in Westville. And that makes sense to me because if they're raising concerns about his mental health, his physical well-being, then that's obviously a crisis that needs to be dealt with from their perspective. Um, At the same time, you know, just with the focus being so much on that, is that unusual at this point in your view? Or is, is that something that you would expect since we're still relatively far out from trial? Yeah, I would expect that. Um, I mean, if you have a client that's in that shape, then, then obviously you want to address it. So um, I wouldn't make too much of it. You know, I, I mean, for the most part, it seems to be that they're doing everything that they are doing. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't make too much of it. That makes sense. And I guess in terms of, you know, getting to the, the incriminating statements, which, of course, we don't know what was said. Uh, we know that it was basically phone calls that were recorded to his wife and mother. Uh, but we don't know what specifically was said. And Brad Rosie even characterized the statements as incoherent and essentially not adding up to a real confession. I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you make of Brad Rosie being the one to actually first bring that up? at the last hearing and um, was that do you feel was that some sort of defense attorney strategy that we, that was on display so he brought it up first yeah he brought it up first hearing. he did interesting um well i mean he's aware of it and i think sometimes it's best to get out of the head of, of bad facts i mean i i always um i mean that's how i address things so i think that's what a credible defense attorney should do if he knows that it's going to come out at some point then it's best to get out ahead of it how would you deal with one of your clients seeming to make statements incriminating himself in the crime that you're defending him for? <laughs> um, well, this you try to deal with it as best you can um, by getting out ahead of it, um, you, you know, and that generally kind of forces your hand, in my opinion, you know, that your client is going to have to testify because, at that moment, a jury's going to want to hear from him. You know, why was that said? Why we, should we consider, um, you know, the circumstances surrounding the statement? And, and the only way to address that is through your client, generally. Oh, my gosh. And, and I mean, my understanding is that having a client testify, especially in a case like this, is a, a pretty big risk. Well, certainly a big risk. You know, the way I look at it, though, is... Uh, you know, that may, many times that's your only way of uh, being successful at trial. Um, I mean, people can talk about the presumption of innocence, but I would say overwhelmingly the juries, uh, juries want to hear uh, from the client and you do everything you can to prepare for them. I mean, my thought always been is, is your client should be the most prepared, well-versed uh, witness in the entire case. I mean, they have access to all the materials. You have the ability to meet with them, especially if they're incarcerated, um, and you just simply get out the bad facts. Ask, you know, I, a big thing of mine is always asking him what the prosecutor may ultimately ask. Leave the prosecutor with nothing for cross examination because you have gotten everything out on direct examination. And the reason for that is what I always tell clients is. They should be comfortable answering questions for, from me. I mean, we've built a rapport during the course of this case. It is really difficult uh, to provide a straight answer to somebody that you don't know. Um, you know, that may be very hostile when they're questioning you. That makes a lot of sense. In, in terms of, um, you know, how, I mean, I think the confessions or the incriminating statements were probably the headline that carried the day to a certain extent, um, maybe among a few other facts that were revealed in the documents. But I'm curious with your thoughts, how do you think about what we've learned about those so far? I think Kevin and I are in the place where we're, you know, sort of just trying to remain undecided as we report on this to, you know, in order to be fair to both sides. But I guess, you know, in, in your view, just based on what we learned about the confessions, what sort of thoughts go through your head about those? Well, it's, it's, uh, 
you know, that alone can be very incriminating, right? I mean, it's alleged evidence that originated from the defendant. But, you know, from the criminal defense point of view, and I guess the lesson to take away from that is if you get a client that is going that is going to be shipped off to the DOC pre-trial, um, address it immediately, get a hearing set immediately, and asking that they be placed, you know, in a county jail nearby. Um, that was kind of my first thought. The idea of uh, Richard Allen going on the witness stand is really intriguing, especially when you consider the condition he's in. How do, how do defense attorneys like yourself deal with uh, clients who may have competency issues or may be drugged? Well, for competency, if, if a client is determined to be incompetent, um, they generally go to a facility I shouldn't say generally, they always go to a facility um, that's monitored by the Division of Mental Health. And then it's at that facility that they would restore um, competency at that point. Um, You know, really, the only way you can do it is you, uh, I guess you're just, you just meet with them more often. You're more hands on um, and, you know, you repeatedly go through their their testimony with them um you know that's really the only way to address it what do you expect to happen next in the case what should we be looking for um you know i don't really know other than obviously looking for some type of amended suppression motion uh and then having some type of hearing associated with it that's really it the only the only other thing that i can think of um is we may see more about the motion in limine regarding ballistics. A motion in limine is generally a motion arguing that particular evidence should not be heard by the jury. As Shea mentioned, the motion in limine in this case regards ballistics. In other words, the defense asks that the jury not be allowed to hear the evidence which the state claims links one of Richard Allen's guns to an unspent shell recovered at the crime. Now, while those on the prosecutorial side of the fence place great faith in this sort of evidence, many on the defense side claim it is basically junk science and that there is no reliable way to indicate that a particular bullet came from a particular gun. As Shea notes in a moment, the Maryland Supreme Court recently issued a ruling that was skeptical of ballistic evidence and would limit its use in that state. We will include a link to that court's opinion in our notes. In an upcoming episode, we'll also include an interview with someone who vigorously defends ballistics evidence. You know, I got to say, that was a pretty bare bones motion. Um, There wasn't any case law in support, but I I can say this, that Maryland Supreme Court came out with a very thorough opinion. Um, Now, I haven't read the entire opinion, but basically... Uh, Maryland came out in a, I think it was a 4-3 decision um, that really limited ballistic or tool marking evidence. Um, And so I expect that uh, Richard Allen's counsel will be relying on that in some form or fashion. It's going to be extremely difficult um, just because Indiana has a case called uh, State v. Turner or Turner v. State. where the Indiana Supreme Court said essentially that an examiner's conclusion in such circumstances is admissible. And in that case, the fact pattern was police didn't even recover a firearm. Uh, They just found an unspent round that had been ejected uh, that was at the residence where the defendant was residing at for the night and then found, I think, four spent rounds um, or spent cartridges at the crime scene, and then they compared uh, the items, and the examiner came back. These were all ejected from the same instrument, in this case an unknown firearm, and the court said that is admissible. Um, so it's going to be very difficult to keep that evidence out. Probably the best they could do is kind of limit it, that um, – you can only testify about your conclusion. I mean, best case scenario for them would be that the lab analyst can only testify that, hey, it, it, 
I believe it's uh, ejected from this make and model of the firearm, not this specific firearm. That certainly makes sense. Um, what do you think about the January 2024 trial date at this time? Does that sound realistic? Um, I have my doubts that uh, that they will have that trial date. I mean, uh, I would guess that it, it, it may be probably another year or so before this is close to being tried. Absolutely. And then is there anything else that we didn't ask you about, Shay, that you wanted to mention, expand upon, or sort of bring up? No, I believe that's it. Awesome. Well, we so appreciate all your insight and you being so generous with your time with us. And thanks again for what you did with this filing. I feel like it's really advanced the public knowledge about this case and what's going on and sort of uh, indicates all the things that we wanted to know about behind the scenes. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. We'll be in touch later. We want to thank Shay for sharing his expertise with us. Again, we suggest you follow him on Instagram. His name there is Hoosier Public Defender. We'll also include a link to that in our show notes. He reliably offers top-notch legal analysis of not just the Richard Allen case, but other interesting cases. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet Discussion Group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. I want to take a moment here to say thanks again to Brilliant Earth. I, I think in this day and age, it's always difficult to find a company that delivers fine quality products while still maintaining high ethical standards. And that's especially hard to find in the jewelry business. But Brilliant Earth is that company. Absolutely. They have actually trademarked their beyond conflict free guarantee. That essentially means that they're going above and beyond to ensure that their diamonds are ethically sourced. They offer a wide range of different natural diamonds as well as lab diamonds. But you can rest assured that these are going to be coming from operators and countries that are maintaining global standards when it comes to labor and environmental practices. So you won't have your special ring, your engagement ring, your wedding band be tainted with this idea that it came from an unethical and problematic situation. It's a real load off of your mind as a consumer because even try as we might, it's all it's often hard to kind of maintain those best practices in your own life when you're shopping for products. So this is a brand that does the work for you in that. And you can visit their website. They have a terrific selection of quality merchandise. Yeah, absolutely. I love that it's not just diamond engagement rings and wedding bands. Uh, they have jewelry for men. They have religious jewelry. They have tennis bracelets that are super cute. I love their um, willow rings because they're kind of like have a nature-y vibe. And I mean, I, I don't consider myself like a hippie or anything, but I, I, I vibe with those. I think they were really pretty. I also like their freesia diamond rings. Those are more of like the classic engagement ring you think of when you think of engagement rings. And so I just think it, there's something for everybody. I think you can go in there and look at some of their beautiful offerings, but you could actually go and design 
your own ring to ensure that you're getting the perfect thing that just matches your personality, makes a statement and, you know, tells people a bit about, you know, what you like, what your tastes are and, and how you are as a person. So uh, if you're looking for an engagement ring, if you're looking for a wedding band, if you're just looking for a gift uh, uh, for someone that you care about who loves jewelry, visit BrilliantEarth.com. They've got a great selection. Check it out. And you really can't go wrong with that. And again, that's BrilliantEarth.com.